right. Let me go ahead and get started here. People are still joining. But in the interest of time, we will get started. It's 12.15. So um, the uh, talk today is on Lewy body disease. So the, the title of this is diagnosing, diagnosing and Treating the Second Most Common Cause of Dementia but I will say the most commonly missed or most commonly misunderstood. Uh, you could put both of those in the same category. I have a number of patients that arrive to emergency departments or in the hospital and medical staff, you know, RNs and, um, and MDs and uh, NPs just have not even heard of Lewy body disease or, or know much about it. So it's good to get that information out. And that's part of what we try to do with this talk. We did have a whole session actually last weekend. Uh, Saturday was what we call Spark, which is sparking the conversation on Lewy body disease, raising awareness for it. We had that um, Saturday from 9.30 to 12.30. There was about 140 uh, folks that attended that, and so it was very uh, well received. Um, that one was more specific for providers of care, um, whereas we're going to have another one. So October is the Lewy Body Awareness Month, and so we'll have one for um, families and community. But obviously, any providers are welcome to join that one too. That'll be um, October 14th. So you can email for more information on that if, if uh, you want to attend. Um, the objectives of this talk. So I want to update everyone on kind of what is the core clinical criteria for this disease. Um, but also recognizing what some of those prodromal and supportive features are for the disease. Um, we'll talk about something called the Lewy body composite risk score, um, as well as trying to define more of this mild cognitive impairment stage um, that evolves into dementia with Lewy bodies, but also what are some of the treatment options, because treatment can make a major difference in this disease. So um, we'll start with a case. This is a 72-year-old that has uh, three years worsening, quote-unquote, memory problems. Um, this all kind of started after a low back surgery. Fluctuations uh, are noted, so there'll be times where he'll just kind of be sitting at the kitchen table, staring off, kind of absent-minded. Um, he's got more uh, apathy in regards to his hobbies, withdrawing from many of those. He's got sleep apnea history, but isn't using his CPAP. He's got some slowed walking speed as well as two unexplained falls over the last year. And then when you do a review of systems, he's got constipation. He's got quote unquote dizziness, which you have to tease out further. Um, insomnia, nightmares. He's been diagnosed with PTSD in the past. Um, but when you ask his wife further, you know, a, a very pointed question is, uh, one, are you guys sleeping in the same room? Because if they're not, uh, some of the reasons for that is, well, he accidentally punched me while well, during a dream at one time, right? Or um, he yells out in his dreams consistently. And so those are important reasons to, to ask about. Um, he's also having increased excessive daytime sleepiness. His medication list, uh, so he's on valproic acid for migraines, oxybutynin for urinary incontinency, or sorry, urinary urgency. Um, he wasn't yet having incontinence. Uh, metoprolol for high blood pressure. On his neuro exam, so he has cognitive testing that it is, is abnormal. Uh, so on our short test of mental status, it's consistent with about a mild dementia range. We always want to see, well, where are our patients missing the points? So construction on the cube and clock were difficult. And then a lot of points on attention and encoding. So it was as difficult to get him to remember the four words initially as it was to remember at least two of the four on the delayed memory portion. So we can see this troubles of getting stuff to stick, this encoding process on immediate recall be uh, one of the presenting uh, features on, on cognitive testing, which then in turn impairs memory if those things aren't sticking, right? Um, on neuro exam, so he, he's got some decreased facial expression. So just generally more of a blank stare type look, less expressive with his face. We call this hypomemia. Um, decreased voice projection. So if I would have listened to him a couple of years ago, his wife said his voice would have projected a lot better. She has to ask him what he's saying a lot of the times now. He's got decreased bilateral arm swing and a positive pull test, meaning when we kind of tug him backwards, he falls back into me and is unable to resist that. An MRI scan, uh, this is not his actual scan, but a representative version um, 
hippocampal atrophy is minimal. The, there's really these, these hippocampal structures are pretty normal for age. He's got some central atrophy present. These ventricles are larger than they should be. Um, maybe a little bit of insular atrophy, but no significant vascular disease to explain his cognitive symptoms. And so at this point, um, I'm thinking along the lines of this probable dementia with Lewy bodies. How can I say that based on, you know, I didn't tell you anything about visual hallucinations or, um, you know, or uh, other uh, features that a lot of people say, well, well, if that's not present, then it can't be DLB, right? Um, when we think of dementia, again, going back to some of our previous talks in the year, um, there's enough cognitive decline to, to, to interfere with daily activities. That's our definition of it. Um, but in DLB, we also need at least two out of these four criteria, but you absolutely do not need all four. Um, so he's got this history of acting out dreams at nighttime. And oftentimes, I, I put these sort of in an order that we often see them present, although each patient is unique. It doesn't always present the same way. Um, but that REM sleep behavior disorder is usually something that's present uh, in most cases. But oftentimes we don't have full history. Maybe they don't have a bed partner. Maybe there's they haven't been sleeping in the same room for five or 10 years. Uh, and we don't necessarily know in some cases, right? And if you ask the patient, they're not going to know they're sleeping, right? So it has to be a, a, a bed partner. Um, cognitive fluctuations. So this is really a key one. So this is like where there's you know, if you ask someone, uh, do your symptoms fluctuate? And, and, and if they say, yeah, some days are good, some days are bad, I will tell you that every patient with dementia has good days and bad days. Um, so that doesn't help you differentiate. This is like hard to predict hour to hour, or sometimes even minute to minute fluctuations. That's what we mean when we say these drastic changes in alertness or arousal. It's almost like delirium, but obviously not in, a, in an ac as acute of a setting. Um, so these patients have been diagnosed with seizure disorders uh, that I've seen just because they maybe it's absent seizures or something like that. Um, but these drastic cognitive um, and just, you know, just like falling asleep easily too. Uh, so arousal changes are common. Um, visual hallucinations, uh, obviously when they're present can really help you, right? Um, you know, especially when they're well-formed, complex uh, visions. But I will say that there's usually preceding symptoms that aren't as well recognized. So, so patients can have what's called a feeling of presence, like someone is in the room, they go check it out, they, uh, you know, they've got this feeling of presence. This has been well described uh, in the literature. Um, and that may precede visual hallucinations by years, actually. Um, paranoid delusions or misidentification syndromes um, can occur as well, well before visual hallucination. So that, so I just want to point out there's a spectrum of neuropsychiatric symptoms that, that patients present with, even though they might ha not have that clear visual hallucinations. And then Parkinsonism, you don't have to have Parkinson's disease diagnosis, but at least one of these kind of features, and I sort of rank these in the, the order we usually see them, usually postural instability and falls is one of the major symptoms we see of Parkinson's with Lewy body patients. Um, bradykinesia is slow movements, rigidity, stiffness, and then tremor is, is less common. And when it is present in Lewy body disease, it's usually more bilateral and almost looks more like an essential tremor, which makes it very difficult for uh, most physicians to kind of differentiate. So in this gentleman's case, you know, one of the key things to do here is removing contributing medications. So I, I listed some specific ones that I wanted to, to point out. So oxybutynin, crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it works really well for urinary uh, urgency and, and sometimes even incontinence, um, but it, it is anticholinergic. That's how it works. And that impairs cognition, especially in patients that are very sensitive to anticholinergics. So that absolutely has to be switched, right? Um, there's, there's a non-anticholinergic version. Uh, so um, this one would be the, the highest preference there are some anticholinergics that at least in theory have less penetration of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so those are preferred over oxybutynin, but, but uh, patients can have a decreased blood-brain barrier with these diseases too. So I still would prefer this first one if possible. Um, titration off the valproic acid. So we have plenty of other medicines for migraines these days. This patient was on this for like, I think it was like 15 years. 
Um, and it was working pretty well for the for the migraines, but it's contributing to um, balance issues. It's contributing to cognition, especially as he gets older and as he has this disease. So his cognitive reserve to deal with CNS depressing medicines are less. Um, so he started on Botox injections, and by the second or third injection, you know, about six months in, he was getting a lot of benefit with this. And you can always consider some of the newer agents or Cephaly device. Uh, these are uh, not going to cause any cognitive uh, side effects. So then how do we manage cognitive symptoms? So if you if you don't learn anything else other than uh, you absolutely have to get patients on drugs that are promoting acetylcholine because Lewy body patients are deficient, highly deficient in this neurotransmitter. And so uh, usually we recommend, and I should put denepazil here, but the brand name being Aircep, which we don't ever use. Um, so we start on denepazil. Um, that's our first line agent, but about 20 to 25% of patients will get side effects, specifically GI ones. Um, he had significant nausea with this. We tried splitting the dose to where it was, you know, breakfast and dinner, uh, but he still um, was having, he had, a, he had a very sensitive stomach. So then we switched to a rivastigmine patch, which is transdermal through the skin. And the side effect rate of that is like five to 6%, so much better tolerated. Um, and we were able to titrate up to higher doses over a couple months. His cognitive testing improved by about seven points. So he's almost basically in a normal range of cognition where most of this uh, improved in that attention and encoding part of memory. He was still missing points on his construction. Um, for sleep, so, so I've never met a patient with Lewy body disease that doesn't have a sleep problem. Uh, uh, so, so REM sleep behavior disorder being the most common one we see, but obstructive sleep apnea is extremely common. Insomnia is extremely common. Excessive daytime sleepiness is extremely common. And then when patients sleep during the day and then they struggle at nighttime, they can start to flip their nights and days. So um, sleep is a major, major, major thing that we have to focus on in Lewy body disease. Um, so most patients, as they get older, uh, can get deficient in melatonin. Melatonin does not work as a sleep aid in the sense that it knocks you out, but it does help promote that circadian rhythm adjustment, which can be off in patients, particularly with Lewy body disease. And it's also our first line treatment for room sleep behavior disorder. So sometimes we need higher doses, though. I always start at a low dose, like three milligrams, but every week or so we can increase that by three milligrams to a max dose usually of 12 to 15. We don't generally go higher than that. Um, some patients can get significant side effects if you start at that high. So you really have to start low and go slow. Um, for him, it did help with some of his insomnia, but he was still having a lot of PTSD and paranoia events throughout the night. And for him, we started a low dose of clonazepam of 0.25 and then increased uh, to 0.5 after about a week or two. And those events started to resolve, these PTSD, paranoia events. He was, he was then able to start sleeping through the night. His RBD, his REM sleep behavior disorder was much improved. Um, and, and one of the keys, too, is getting him back on a CPAP machine because his sleep apnea, um, untreated sleep apnea, is going to contribute to cognitive symptoms throughout the day as well. So managing uh, Parkinson's symptoms. So we don't do this in all patients, you know, if they don't have dramatic, uh, um, you know, troubles with specific Parkinson's symptoms, then, then obviously we don't want to start a medicine uh, that we don't need to. Um, in his case, he was having a lot more issues with balance as, as uh, sort of the, the months went on. Um, and so we elected to go ahead and trial carbidopa levodopa. This also can sometimes help with the apathy symptoms that we see, which is very common when you get the caudate and putamen of the brain involved, which is highly uh, consistent with what we see in Parkinson's and Lewy body disease. Um, and so generally most patients, we start at a really low dose and increase slowly. Um, some patients need a couple tablets three times a day. Some need a little bit more. Um, it is important to take it without or before meals. Um, and so his improvement started to improve. Uh, but also part of that is he got really plugged in with a, what we call a big and loud program. So a physical and speech therapy uh, program, which uh, really did help his movements and balance. Um, he also joined a local bark, uh, Parkinson's boxing class and was doing quite well actually at this point, both from a motor and cognitive perspective. However, um, he did have a setback. So during one of his jump rope routines, he actually tore his meniscus and all of a sudden couldn't work out. 
Um, he had a lot of setbacks from a depression standpoint here, but we were able to, so he needed a surgery uh, according to his local surgeons and, um, but we were able to work with them to try to avoid kind of the, the typical approach of general anesthesia. And so they were able to do more of a spinal block um, procedure with moderate sedation. And then part of this too, he was able to limit his opiate pain medication exposure postoperatively um, and really didn't suffer any postoperative delirium from this, right? So um, that's one thing we have to try to avoid because if you do experience delirium, which that's a, a big risk factor for patients with Lou by disease, um, then we can often see subsequent cognitive decline in the next 12 months. So delirium seems to be a pretty big predictor of that. Um, we did start him on an SSRI, so we generally use escitalopram or sertraline, um, and that can help with the irritability and some of the depression symptoms. Um, so he's he continues to do quite well. You know, I've followed him for four plus years now, and he's back in his boxing classes. Um, and this is now this was this is outdated here. So it's four years. Um, you know, it stayed relatively stable. It certainly hasn't been as low as it was when we first saw him. So. You know, it, it kind of raises the question is what is the DLB trajectory? I mean, this is a neurodegenerative disease. It is something that absolutely gets worse with time, but it is also something that can be improved uh, both from a symptom standpoint and quality of life standpoint based on a lot of things we can do as providers. So that includes getting patients on the right medicines, um, but also getting off of the wrong medicines. Um, we think that uh, you know acetylcholine is an extremely important neurotransmitter in this disease, um, and so boosting that with these medicines does seem to help in these patients. Um, most of their brain structures, including those memory structures, are intact unless there's co-pathology with Alzheimer's disease, which unfortunately is you know thirty to forty percent of the time we do see some co-pathology. But in patients that have more of a pure DLB type syndrome. Um, they can, you know, their brain structures are intact and they can respond if we help with the neurotransmitter problem. But it is important to realize that they are on thin ice, so they have very limited cognitive reserves. So anything that can tip them over, infection, anesthesia, delirium, so anticholinergic medication, anti-dopaminergic medication, um, they can really decline uh, significantly in those settings. Um, we'll have another talk on purpose of medication in dementia in general, but um, this will be good as a as a reminder for that. Uh, so we always start with denepazil just because it's once a day. It's cheap. Um, it's well tolerated in about seventy five percent of patients. Um, but and I will say in my Lewy body patients, it's usually better tolerated because at baseline, most of them have constipation. Uh, with GI being, if anything, we might start to help regulate their bowel movements better. Um, but in patients with sens sensitive stomachs, this is one that you still want to try, but is probably going to fail because of GI side effects. Um, and, and I should mention too, we have a number of our Lewy body patients on higher than standard doses. We usually start to split them uh, throughout the day once we get above 10 milligrams. And, um, and the purpose of this is they're, they're able to tolerate higher doses because there's less of the GI uh, problem and we see better benefit. Um, but not everyone needs that. Um, there's also galantamine, which we use often. Uh, that's sort of like an intermediate uh, side effect rate, especially when you use the extended release version. Um, I don't use rivastigmine oral medications, even though that's the one that's technically approved for Parkinson's disease, dementia. Um, Really, if there's GI side effects, the, the patch makes the most sense. The side effect rate of that is more like 5 to 6%. Um, the main issue you have to watch out for the patch is, is skin issues. And so um, good skin care is important. Uh, one of those things is, is patients are usually dehydrated, have dry skin. Um, it needs to be careful removal. There needs to be moisturization. Sometimes topical corticosteroids are needed for that sort of just a couple day irritation once the the, once it's removed. Sometimes that's actually the adhesive that's causing that. So making sure they actually get that off is important. Um, we mentioned sort of some ideas of getting creative with these cholinesterase inhibitors. So um, if the denepazil was well tolerated at five milligrams, but then they got side effects at 10, um, we would still like them to be on 10 if possible, but maybe all at once is, is too high. That's causing that peak dose effect, which is causing the side effects. So we try to split the dose throughout the day, five milligrams with breakfast, five milligrams with dinner. 
And, and that can work in a number of patients, just a little bit of creativity with the medicine. Um, we always have to think about uh, heart. So there are some cases where uh, patients come in, they've got baseline bradycardia of 50 uh, heart rate, right? Or they've got a history of heart block, uh, left bundled branch block, or they've got um, a, an extensive cardiac history otherwise. Um, in those cases, if you start this medicine and they get lightheadedness or fatigue, you have to be thinking about heart initially. Um, these drugs can, although mildly, but can contribute to bradycardia, and particularly if there's second degree heart block, and they can contribute to prolonged QTC, especially if patients are on many other drugs that are prolonging their QTC. So you may need to consider EKG baseline and then steady state, um, depending on the cardiac history. Um, I do want to point out, so, I mean, when you're thinking about what is, am I dealing with Lewy disease, you can sometimes ask about other non-cognitive and behavioral symptoms. So autonomic dysfunction is extremely common in Lewy body disease because uh, it is a systemic disease. So they often have orthostatic hypotension. They have troubles with blood pressure regulation. They have issues with urinary incontinence and constipation and runny nose after eating or just runny nose all the time. Um, those can be common symptoms. We we usually see this sort of executive or attention or visual spatial impairment more than memory, but certainly memory can be involved uh, as well. Um, any sort of Parkinson's symptoms we already talked about. We talked about the sleep disorders that are common in this disease. And then the neuropsychiatric features can really span a large gambit. It's not just visual hallucinations. The timeline of things. So th this is not a disease that happens overnight. Uh, you know, this is something that we'll often hear about. It's like in retrospect, yes, there were some prodromal symptoms going back five, 10 years. And these can include the REM sleep, you know, the acting out dreams at nighttime or autonomic symptoms or decreased sense of smell. Um, and, and I've had one patient where that was, was going on for at least 30 plus years, uh, especially the REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and then there's this sort of mild cognitive impairment stage, which is um, sometimes a number of years. And sometimes it's a quick transition from normal and all of a sudden into dementia. That would be a scenario where multiple episodes of delirium, maybe they were put on anticholinergics, right? There sometimes is an accelerating effect based on um, you know, the clinical picture. But we usually look for this non-amnestic mild cognitive impairment, like I just mentioned in the last slide. And then we're a little bit more certain about the diagnosis when it's clear dementia and we start to get these core features involved, right? Um, this is currently where we can diagnose patients, but um, the research criteria is definitely moving it up to this MCI range, and, and we regularly do it in our um, cognitive and behavioral clinic, but um, this is, we need to be able to start diagnosing this sooner because that's where we can make the biggest impact in these diseases. There's actually a whole uh, North American study looking at these prodromal, so it's, it's uh, appropriately named NAPS consortium, um, but they're looking at, so folks that are testing normally on cognitive uh, testing, but have REM sleep behavior disorder, you know, can we start to predict who's going to convert and, and get tests that can do that? And that would also be where we need to enroll patients into preventative sort of, you know, secondary prevention trials to uh, prevent the downstream, um, you know, symptoms of Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease. Um, this is a handy tool here. So this is something that, you know, I've got a little smart phrase that I'll just pull up into my notes um, that basically just has a yes, no box for each one of these. And so you want to ask sort of, you know, within the last six months, and usually not just a one time occurrence, but have there been at least a couple times of, you know, this sort of slowness of movement pattern, that's really asking about bradykinesia there, right? We ask about rigidity, but really that's picked up on exam. Are you seeing decreased arm swing? Are you seeing cogwheel rigidity on your exam? Um, has, there, has there been loss of postural stability? Because that's a big one. Tremor. So sort of, sort of these first four, really, this gets at the motor symptoms of this disease, right? Um, and then there's the non-motor symptoms where we ask about sleep. So there's two different questions about sleep here, but then cognition and neuropsychiatric symptoms. Then lastly, we're asking about um, autonomic dysfunction, because those can all be signs and clues, right? And so if you're scoring three or higher on this, um, especially if you're sort of like, okay, I know this patient has dementia, maybe it's mild dementia syndrome, is this Alzheimer's or Lewy body disease? That's what this sort of AUC 
you know, 0.94 uh, area under the curve is, is uh, suggestive of. Um, so it's not like something you would do in every patient that walks in, right? But if you are wondering, could this be Lewy by disease? This is a very sensitive tool um, to try to help raise your radar for it. Um, some tips for these visits, these can be very long and complicated. So part of that is like when I do cognitive, especially like if I have a resident that I'm working with and they're going over about 20 minutes from the normal time that it would take them to do this. And then I learned that it took them 15 plus minutes just to do the cognitive testing. Um, my, my suspicion for Lewy body disease immediately goes up. Uh, there's often a lot of symptoms involved. So it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Um, there's slowed processing speed that can be involved uh, with the cognitive testing. So they might get the calculation of five times 13 correct, but it might take them over a minute to get there, right? Uh, and so that's where we talk about that slowed processing speed. Um, there, since there can be a number of symptoms, sometimes it's very important to sort of prioritize these, right? So asking the family, what are the three most concerning symptoms to you that you want addressed? Because you may be surprised this patient might be having daily visual hallucinations, but they're not bothered by them at all. So it wouldn't really make sense to spend 10 minutes discussing the visual hallucinations when it's actually the runny nose that's bothering them the most. And because there can be a lot of medication side effects and, and, and medicines that can help, I, I always want to stress that um, I don't like to change more than one variable at a time, uh, particularly with Lewy body patients, because they can be so sensitive to medicines. Um, so it, sometimes it is is setting those expectations that uh, this is going to take weeks to months to really see uh, the benefit, right? But it's going to be worth it in the end because it, it can really make a difference. Um, we do have a Lewy body disease trial. So if you have patients that have a probable DLB, um, they can be eligible for this trial. Um, it used to require lumbar punctures, but now that's an optional thing. So even patients with that are on blood thinners can be eligible now. Um, this is a pill medication that's it's about a seven month study. Um, I know I'm I'm a little bit because I, I, I want to have time for questions, but uh, I think some key takeaways like if you want to simplify, you know, I told you a lot of information. You want to simplify things down a little bit, right? If you've got a patient that has REM sleep behavior disorder, uh, and they've got cognitive impairment, um, and if you add on any autonomic symptoms, Lewy body disease absolutely has to be on your radar. Um, you can use this Lewy body composite risk score to try to help, uh, you know, further your confidence there. Um, and that can be in the absence of any hallucinations or Parkinson's symptoms. Um, there can be further supportive features if they, they've, they're super sensitive to cholinergic medications, dopamine blocking medications that can give you clues. If they've got a dementia syndrome and their brain scan is normal, uh, that can be a clue because we usually see that, um, Kind of multiple episodes of delirium is a clue. Uh, dramatic response to, you know, denepazil and medications like that. Uh, you know, if they get a lot of benefit, then it actually is a potential clue for me as well. Um, so we talked about kind of what those prodromal symptoms are. We outlined some of the sort of uh, principles of DLB care and management, and then uh, sort of how to structure those visits, especially for follow-ups to be most efficient as we can. Um, and then avoiding the pitfalls that um, patients are, are on thin ice here with this disease. And so really trying to avoid those can potentially drastically change what the long-term outcome looks like. And that's what we really have to focus on in this disease. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. And then I saw a couple things in the chat. Okay, most of those are related to CE credit. All right, good. Um, Feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. Any questions about DLB? And I should mention, I didn't include this in the talk, but over the last year, so we've been doing skin biopsy um, tests to basic, they, we could think of them as direct biomarkers of synuclein diseases. So we can detect this protein. Um, we do three biopsies in the neck, the thigh, and the lower leg. Um, and this is like a 90 plus percent sensitive and like 96 to 99 percent specific test. Um, 
Now, it's not the same as biopsying the brain, but it does tell us what's happening in the nervous system. And if you've kind of got all these clinical features that oh, this is possible Lewy body disease, and then you have a positive synuclein biomarker, um, you can be much more confident about that. Um, it's it's something that is covered by insurance, and it seems to be a really good test. I use it much more preferentially over something like a DAT scan, um, but a DAT scan is FDA approved for Lewy body disease now. So it's something that if the DAT scan's positive, it can really help you, but it's less sensitive, especially in early disease. So in like mild cognitive impairment stages, the DAT scan is somewhere around 70 or 69% sensitive. So there's going to be a lot of cases that it might come back normal that you might miss if that's what you're relying on for your diagnosis. All right. No questions, clear as mud. Uh, the uh, next talk will be by Michelle Needon. So um, have a happy 4th of July. We won't be here next week, but then July 14th, and she's gonna talk. So she's our excellent Cognitive Care Network uh, leader and really what's the power behind a multidisciplinary care team, including our social workers and our primary docs and specialists like myself. So, all right. I guess we will end it there if no questions.